Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I wish I could be in person with many of you, but uh, I'm grateful for this platform and to be able to do it this way. Uh, my name is Mike Guggenheimer. I am the president and CEO of RSC Biosolutions. We are a global industrial biotechnology company. Uh, we have worked for many years with uh, marine players, leading marine players who are looking to reduce environmental risk or human health risk using advanced technology. Uh, we are best known in the marine space for our renewable and biodegradable lubricants that are built on a platform of PAO and synthetic hydrocarbons, uh, which I'll talk about later, presents a, a pretty unique uh, performance advantage over uh, a lot of alternative environmental technology. So I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but I wanted to begin just by talking about what is behind our involvement in this in this industry and our our focus on this technology? Uh, you know, it's it's this group doesn't need an introduction to uh, the new metrics that we're dealing with. It's not just regulations. There are uh, lots of pressures to address environmental and human health issues. Uh, but it's not all regulations uh, that are providing pressure. There's also a lot of incentives. We heard from the ports earlier. Uh, there are many uh, stakeholder groups that are providing incentives to be more sustainable or reduce environmental impact. Uh, but for all of us, uh, we have to do it profitably. We have to operate in this space uh, with all of the regular day-to-day -day pressures of running our businesses. So, you know, the big challenge that we see is how do people do this without uh, compromising the business? Our view is that you know, uh, it no longer is a requirement to experience trade-offs or compromise the business to reduce environmental risk or human health risk. Um, you know, I think that a lot of people, if, when they hear of green technology, I think the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, it's going to work half as well. It's going to cost twice as much. Uh, and in fact, I think for lubricants in the past, that was an issue. They weren't as durable. Uh, they had issues with water and heat. They weren't readily available. Uh, un unfortunately, there still are some technologies in the marine space that are not uh, as fit for purpose as others that, that may not survive a typical five-year dry docking cycle. But the good news is technology has advanced. The supply chain has advanced. And now there are uh, a host of readily available advanced technologies that um, are highly compatible with existing systems. Uh, and in many cases, they provide performance advantages over uh, a traditional fluid. And I think um, that's the kind of thing that, that gets us excited. It is part of what our mission is all about. Um, we do believe that addressing these risks and, and following up on these trends can be done in a way that's smart for the business. Um, the reason that um, we feel like we are in a good position to provide solutions to in this area is our focus has been entirely on green technology, biodegradable, renewable technologies for close to 40 years. So we feel like that focus and that dedication has uh, taken us uh, kind of up the learning curve on how to create products that work in today's systems, in a wide variety of, of marine applications that are very demanding. Um, and, uh, you know, it also provides an opportunity for us to educate customers on where these trends are headed. And, and that, I think that notion of the applications that we focus on is very important. Uh, there are a number of applications where uh, a basic, you know, vegetable-based product will work fine. Uh, but in the marine application and other demanding applications, uh, it really requires a performance level that is, is pretty unique. So for us, the, the sweet spot for us is a combination of uh, assets or equipment or vessels that are operating in sensitive environments and have pretty demanding operating conditions. So, you know, when you look at these, these images here, uh, you know, you may think, well, what does a turf mower and a marine vessel have in common? Well, what, what the commonality is uh, the risk of a spill, the risk of an exposure can be significant. Uh, 
you know, a blown hydraulic line on a, a fairway or a green can ruin the green. You know, a, a spill around a thruster at port that creates a rainbow sheen in the water uh, can be a big problem. And uh, at the same time, these are pieces of equipment that are running day in and day out and sometimes very long periods of time before there is a changeover. So our focus is to try to create alternatives to traditional fluids that, that do both, that address these trends, address these risks without sacrificing performance. And so when we think about performance, that can mean a number of things. Uh, it can be effectiveness. Does it work in the system? Uh, it can be cost uh, of ownership. It can be the durability. How long does it last? Uh, the stability with uh, interaction with water and air and heat. Um, and, and I think, you know, people want to introduce new technology that doesn't create new hassles, that doesn't provide or doesn't require some other extra work or introduce additional risk. And then on the sustainability side, uh, there are a number of things that people look at there. Readily biodegradable, minimally toxic, uh, doesn't sheen in the water, uh, safety around people and, and broadly for the environments that these uh, marine equipment is operating in. But I think that at least our experience over many years is that uh, it's one thing to talk about results in a lab uh, and to show charts about how the chemistry works. It is often much more important to demonstrate experience in the field. Uh, how does it work in a stern tube? in a piece of deck equipment, in a DP thruster. And uh, our uh, experience has led us to generate uh, lots of oil analysis data, and we're able to demonstrate uh, well beyond the typical five-year dry docking cycle, uh, 60,000 hour plus in some applications. And it includes, uh, for some of our technologies, a 10-year warranty. Uh, because of our ability to demonstrate performance well beyond a five-year dry docking cycle. And as, as always, it's got to be backed by OEM approvals, which is a big part of what we do. Um, I'll touch on it in a minute, but uh, I mentioned our reputation in this industry for lubricants. That, that range continues to expand over the last year. Uh, greases have been a significant part of our extension. Uh, a lot in the marine industry are looking at deck equipment uh, and the potential exposure to water for things like wire rope and deck hydraulic systems. But as a result of COVID, the concerns around cleaning and disinfecting have, have increased significantly. Uh, and while it has been less support, important in this segment historically, it's become a lot more important this year for us. And I'll touch briefly on what we're doing in cleaning and disinfecting because uh, I think it may be interesting to, to some in the audience today. So what I'm going to do is talk quickly about uh, our environmental lubricant technology and then talk quickly about uh, the cleaning and disinfecting technology. Just to touch on those two things, uh, sometimes we might spend an entire webinar talking just about environmental lubricants and the different types of lubricants. So I'll say from the beginning that I can't possibly uh, go into all the detail in a, in a 15 minute presentation, but we would love the opportunity if anybody wants a deeper understanding of these technologies to, to set up a follow-up conversation. Uh, I think that we take for granted that people understand what an, an environmental lubricant is. Uh, for us, it has been driven by the US EPA's definition of an EAL, which is focused on being readily biodegradable, minimally toxic, and not accumulative in the water. Uh, but we also consider a number of other factors, renewability, carbon content, uh, sheening in the water are all very important in this space. I do think what is often not understood in this industry is that there are lots of different types of EALs. Uh, some are more fit for purpose in a marine application than others. Uh, for example, you rarely see a trigil triglyceride technology, the one on the left that says HETG, in a stern tube application. It is perfectly suited for a uh, fairway mower or an aerial lift uh, equipment in a land application, but it will not withstand uh, the heat and water ingress that you would see in a marine application. Uh, 
So a lot of what we do uh, in this space is to help people understand which technology is appropriate for different applications and their applications. Uh, specifically for us, our focus has been on that HEPR class, uh, the PAO and synthetic hydrocarbon type of technology, uh, because it presents the highest stability, highest compatibility, uh, particularly in environments where water and heat can be an issue. Uh, for a lot of applications, it, it doesn't come into play, but more and more, we see vessels that have uh, applications and propulsion systems that are experiencing higher heat uh, due to either size or alignment or other challenges. Uh, and it's virtually impossible to reduce the risk of some sort of water ingress. So to really reduce the risk of a failure of a fluid, uh, a product that has the characteristics of a petroleum fluid, but the benefits of a sustainable fluid becomes extremely uh, uh, interesting to a marine operator who wants simply to be able to drop a product into their system and not worry about other uh, auxiliary uh, costs or, or risks that get introduced. Um, this is something, again, uh, we spend a lot of time talking about. Uh, our, our team is, is deep in terms of research in this space, and we would love the opportunity to kind of explain more about the different types of EALs. Um, but I think the key kind of summarization of, of what these technologies can do, particularly the HEPR technology in the marine space, is first compatibility. Uh, do they drop into existing systems with the least need to change out seals, uh, add uh, filtering systems, add other systems to compensate for the weakness of the fluid? Does it have the stability in terms of lubricating performance and maintaining viscosity over a very long period of time? Not two years, not four years, but five, ten years. Uh, can you demonstrate that level of stability? Uh, does it meet all the environmental requirements and is it going where the, the needs are going? And then lastly, can you get it around the world, which has been a big, big factor, obviously, in the marine space. Being able to deliver 24-7 is critical uh, and we're able to do that. Um, before I wrap it up, um, I do want to kind of switch gears slightly because I think it's very relevant to today's times. Um, you know, I, I would, wouldn't have talked about these technologies in, uh, in, our, in the marine industry a lot in the past uh, because of the demand and interest in our lubricant technology. But this year, uh, we all know, has presented some new challenges. And, uh, uh, as a result, what we have done is brought to bear a lot of our expertise in biotechnology, our expertise that we use in other markets for cleaning and disinfecting, and are now bringing that to the marine industry uh, to re react to the needs that we see right now as a result of this pandemic. Um, you know, what we're seeing and hearing from our customers is, you know, these the new threats of, of risk of, you know, virus uh, transmission and concerns both from employees but also passengers and and worker safety is rising in importance and um, our customers are telling us that they feel a sense of responsibility to address this issue um, so what we have done with this platform is created a integrated group of products that are designed to support this this need to address cleaning uh, for health and cleaning for safety, but doing it in a way that is consistent with our uh, push towards environmental safety and human health safety. So everything on this platform is uh, sustainable, but at the same time, it's designed to be high performance. So effective, cost-effective, efficient, easy to use, versatile. Uh, so this could be a cleaner, it could be a traditional botanical disinfectant, or in the case of what I wanted to share today, a uh, very new innovation that provides durable protection against viruses and bacteria, including the virus SARS-CoV-2 that causes the disease COVID-19. Um, this technology is the first and only residual antiviral coating uh, that has received uh, uh, approval from the EPA. It essentially goes on as a, um, a coating that will, once it's down, dries and is virtually 
uh, invisible, it's not tacky, it's non-odorous. And again, it's the very first one to receive approval by the EPA, uh, and it's being used right now by American Airlines uh, to provide safety for passengers in that application. Uh, we think that there, and we're seeing demand already in the marine space, that this has some potential interest and value for marine. Uh, obviously, uh, applications like a cruise vessel is uh, comes to mind because of the a lot of passengers moving in and out of spaces, but um, uh, workplaces, both onshore offices as well as offshore and on vessel crew areas can be significantly uh, challenging to figure out how do you keep them safe. So if you have a durable way to pro provide protection to surfaces, we think it's going to be pretty interesting uh, in this market. So uh, with that, I will wrap it up. I, I tried to cover a lot here, but um, you know, I think the key message is for us, uh, it's about trying to really produce products that uh, can deliver and address the trends and regulations in the space without introducing new households and without trading off performance or cost. So thank you again for the opportunity. Look forward to answering questions and following up if, if there are any kind of details that people want to understand. Mike, uh, thanks a lot for uh, your presentation and a very broad overview of different topics. I've monitored both uh, Q&A and chat windows. Uh, I'm trying to give it a moment to see if anyone has any burning questions to ask. Uh, but as I'm refreshing uh, for the moment, there are no questions. But as I've mentioned for previous speakers, I'm sure Mike will stay around for a bit and you can interact with him on a, either on the public chat or the, the private uh, messaging option and, uh, and, and then continue on the conversation uh, in that way. Yes, I'm happy to do that. I know there's a lot of overlap with some of the other discussions, uh, with questions in the past about lubricants and ports, and and um, we're very interested in learning. So if uh, anybody wants to connect with me, please do, and happy to talk more about this. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Mike. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today and for giving the uh, 